it takes morning, everyone. I think we can get started, and maybe some other people will check it in. Uh, my name is Ed Remix. I'm the moderator of this panel and a member of the Politics Affiliated Society. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for being today. Uh, unfortunately, I heard from Taya Heller that uh, she could not uh, attend. She let me know uh, the other day about that, uh, which is unfortunate because uh, we were hoping she could speak to the social ecology perspective and to the work of Marie Bookchen. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to uh, proceed without her today. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, present a few introductory remarks to kind of frame some of the questions. And then after that, uh, each of the panelists will have an opportunity to speak and then to respond to each other. And then we can open it up for questions. So technological change under capital has tended to generate two forms of political response, romantic rejection modernistic embrace. In 1995, the neo-Luddite Kirkpatrick Sale began a public lecture by smashing a computer to pieces uh, with his hammer. I, I won't perform any theatrics like that today. Uh, at the same time, Antonio Negri entreated knowledge workers to wake up from their slumbers. Communism had arrived as their digital labor was immaterial. Between rejection and embrace stood Jeremy Rifkin, a reform-minded activist who diagnosed increasing and permanent unemployment due to automation. Rifkin suggested that the victims of this process be put to work in the new nonprofit sector. These are just a few examples of how technological unemployment captured the attention of the 1990s left, but in a way that now seems antiquated. Activist movements emerged to oppose globalization, imperialism, and most recently finance capital. The politicization of compulsory work appears rare by comparison. Yet the historical left's most compelling visions of social emancipation have related crucially to understandings of technology and work. For this reason, we pose a number of untimely questions here today. First, can Marxism explain some of the broadest social and technological changes that have taken place since the 1960s? For Marx, the working class's organization around higher wages drives capitalists to, int to introduce labor-saving technologies, a dynamic which unconsciously increases both social productivity and unemployment, while decreasing surplus value available to capitalists. This dynamic generates crises to which the capitalist state responds. Later Marxists observed that the liberal, Fordist, and neoliberal periods have each entailed increases of productivity and renegotiations of labor standards but during varying configurations of political consciousness on the left. How then do the innovations of recent decades, including cybernetics, automation, and digitization, contrast with the development and deployment of productive technologies in the past, whether 50, 100, or 200 years ago? Is technological advance bound up with social totality, or does it take place in a relatively autonomous sphere with its pace guided by the progress of science? How do Marxist understandings of categories such as value, labor, and class bear upon narratives of social change, such as post-industrial society, information society, third wave, and late capitalism? Second, how does the decline of the left in the 20th century bear upon the abolition of wage labor? The reduction of working hours was a fixture of 19th century socialism, and Paula Farb's The Right to Be Lazy, calling for a 15-hour working week, was a bestseller among the Second International. More contentious was the question of whether Russian industry had developed sufficiently by 1917 to allow for truly socialist, as opposed to merely liberal bourgeois, productions in compulsory labor. While Stalin industrialized Russia and made a cult of work, the Great Depression left millions of men and machines idle. Trotsky described conditions for revolution as not only ripe, but somewhat rotten. Non-Marxists, such as Russell and Keynes, called for a reduced working week as did the once popular Shorter Hours Movement. Yet organized labor chose not to pursue a reduced working week, fighting instead for New Deal policies which alleviated only privileged sections of workers by comparison. By 1956, Adorno and Horkheimer still spoke of abolishing wage labor as an emancipatory goal. But this goal seemed abandoned elsewhere. Is it fair to claim, as some have, that the 20th century left traded the goal of abolishing work for a kind of workerism? Third, what was politically possible after the new left? The 1960s left appears highly ambivalent about the working class. Theories of a post-scarcity, post-industrial society were gaining purchase, arising from a wide range of new leftists, such as Gores, 
academic sociologists such as Bell, anarchists such as Bookchin, and futurists such as Hoffler. For some, the technology-enabled abolition of work reemerged as the left's core vision of emancipation. This called into question the working class orientations of organized labor, parliamentary socialism, Bolshevism, and Maoism. While Parismo and early autonomous Marxism tentatively shared this rethinking of the traditional working class. Yet during the very same period, the new communist movement typically followed the what is to be done model of party building, and fused cadres with the factories and neighborhoods of the industrial proletariat. For those who continued to hold the industrial proletariat capable of being a revolutionary subject, how were phenomena such as plant closings, layoffs, and industrial automation politicized? Considering that the working class was losing work throughout much of the 1970s and 1980s, how did the left respond, and what could the left have done? Fourth, can technology or lack thereof explain the failures of actually existing socialism? In 1980, Alvin Toffler announced the third wave. After the first agricultural and second industrial waves, a third information-based wave had arrived and would eventually overcome material scarcity. For Toffler, who grew up in and around the communist movement prior to McCarthyism, socialism and capitalism share a key limitation. They are industrializing projects in the second wave. Some have taken this to mean that socialism has never hitherto been possible, not only because Russia faced the challenge of industrialization, but because, as Martin Nikolaus suggested in 1968, even highly developed countries remain largely industrial and thus premature. Insofar as this narrative seeks to explain the failures of revolutionary movements in Europe and the United States, it is interesting to note that many new communist movement veterans embraced Toffler's third wave thesis, especially after 1989. Is post-industrial society more amenable to emancipatory social transformation than industrial society? And if so, why? Finally, what became of the left's mid-1990s engagement with technological unemployment? Between 1994 and 1996, a strange abundance of books engaging questions of technology and labor were published. Jeremy Rifkin's The End of Work, Kirkpatrick Sale's Rebels Against the Future, Stanley Aronowitz's The Jobless Future, Chris Freeman's Work for All or Mass Unemployment, William Julius Wilson's When Work Disappears, Parton Negri's Labor of Dionysus. What can the next generation of on the left learn from 1990s debates about immaterial labor, the jobless future, and the end of work? Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to our panelists to begin. And uh, we'll start with George. OK, thank you. We've got a, a dense set of issues to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> An hour long question, yes. and four minutes answer. <laughs> right. Um, and so, so inevitably, the, we'll have to uh, take, take one step at a time. OK? Um, I'd like to correct my comment my comments to the, the fifth question, because um, the, this issue uh, concerning uh, the end of work, the um, themes of post-industrial uh, society have been something that has uh, been very much part of my political and theoretical life for decades. Um, and it's a, it's a good moment to step back and uh, look and see what has happened in terms of these theses. Um, because uh, in, a, in a very important sense, uh, we've had uh, a discombination uh, in a, both an empirical and a theoretical way of uh, some of the most uh, flagrant forms of uh, views that we were at the period world historical period uh, that uh, meant the end of the work, the end of uh, basically the labor theory of value and what it's um, uh, what, what it has meant in terms of <clears throat> operational capitalism in not only our period but the previous So this is, uh, uh, I, I think that this confirmation has at least two sides to it. By the way, how much time is that? 10 minutes or 10 minutes? Um, 
the, this confirmation in terms of uh, the, uh, the question of um, uh, whether we have actually come to this uh, world historical period um, is a uh, people, one empirical. Uh, I think that the, over the last, um, since 1989, in fact, uh, and since the double um, developments of both structural adjustment policies around the world, uh, the, the family uh, had a major impact throughout the, throughout the planet, especially in the former colonial world, as well as, of course, the, uh, the end of the official Communist Party um, uh, hegemony in uh, uh, Eastern Europe and uh, the former Soviet Union. What we've had, actually, is if, if these theories concerning post-industrial society were correct, we want to have uh, a situation where uh, billions of people uh, in, uh, in China, in uh, Africa, in South America, in Eastern Europe, billions and billions of people um, who would be, in effect, without work. But actually, when we step back and we see actually that the world labor market, that is the number of workers that are available for uh, work in commodity production um, for the world market actually has tremendously increased in the last um, 20 to 25 years. Um, I think that uh, the, the entrance, uh, you, you asked, you have a question about that? I want to that's by that. Okay. Uh, um, so, if we look at uh, what has happened in terms of uh, the, the impact of the, uh, these major political economic changes that have taken place, in fact, instead of having a breakdown, a major uh, um, major crisis uh, in terms of uh, livelihood uh, for billions of people would be actually uh, funds. The other thing that uh, I think is important is to begin to see that at least some of the uh, adherents uh, or former adherents to the, uh, uh, the this kind of end of work uh, uh, conception of contemporary capitalism uh, have sort of changed their position quite dramatically. Um, I'm not sure exactly why some of these people, like uh, Tony Levy, for example, and uh, Christian Marazzi and a whole set of people who are often called the autonomous Marxists. Oops, excuse me. Um, uh, who are called the autonomous Marxists, uh, they basically have sort of shifted them uh, from the view that uh, the, the labor theory of value no more applies to capitalism. It seems to be, uh, that, that, that seems to have. Uh, on by the wayside, and what has happened is that the, this type of work that is associated and often called material labor um, is being seen as actually productive of value, but in and of itself, uh, this, uh, this value is not measurable. It is, um, so the, the view is that we have a, uh, a kind of work that is largely uh, autonomous of capital but which capital still can uh, capture some value from, although that value is not the value of the sort that um, um, we associate with the, the classic Marxist description of uh, how surplus value is generated and captured by, uh, excuse me, um, uh, captured by uh, uh, the capitalist system. So I would say that these these two developments are, uh, speak to exactly your question, that uh, this, um, uh, these theories of the end of work that um, developed in the 1990s uh, have, in a sense, uh, uh, not, have been sort of have been rejected um, and are not part of the present discussion. Um, so I, I would say um, there's, there's a lot more to say about uh, these, uh, these other questions, but uh, 
I'm looking forward to seeing about uh, developing a discussion here concerning both the empirical and the theoretical changes that have occurred since the 1990s. Okay. Chris, thank you. Okay, well, um, I, I guess I'm um, here to defend this kind of post industrial current of thinking. Um, you, you mentioned the Marty Nicholas article on the unknown Marx, and um, I, too, was very much influenced that Nicholas was writing um, about Marx's Rundresse, which, you know, he was among the um, first to translate, and um, these were the notebooks that Marx wrote in preparation for writing Capital, and there are passages in the Grundrisse where Marx anticipates this advanced stage of automation. Um, you know, he, he's literally looking like 100 years forward in terms of where technology was at the time that he was writing. And so just to give you um, chapter and verse, um, the slightly edited, in this transformation, what appears as the mainstay of production and wealth is the appropriation by man, sick, of his own general productive force, his understanding of nature and the mastery of it, in a word, the development of the social individual. The theft of others' labor time, upon which wealth depends today, seems to be a miserable basis compared with this newly developed foundation that has been created by heavy industry or automation. So I, I think that um, this, I continue to find this inspiring um, and a way of understanding contradictions which are playing out um, at this point in time. But I would essentially separate this, um, what I see as a kind of a post-industrial argument that um, at a certain stage in the development of technology, productive forces, if you will, um, there are a set of contradictions which are new and different from the contradictions of earlier moments of, of economic development. And um, that I, I would distinguish, I think that the, um, I was never um, associated with the kind of end of work position. I, I think that, um, that even if one includes China, uh, one can see a contraction globally in the amount of manufacturing the, the size of the manufacturing labor force globally, but obviously there are huge expansion of jobs in the service sector and, and so forth. So I see the contradiction. I, obviously, unemployment displacement is part of the of the tension, but I really think that the core um, that Marx's insight gets at is that um, science and technology become a productive force. And the advance of society is no longer dependent upon the bourgeoisie. That their savings and investment, their entrepreneurial skill, is no longer at the center of the development of the human capacity to produce uh, more and better and more, more freely. So it's that contradiction that um, the post-industrial moment opens up this possibility of, of a self-organization or a deeper possibility of a self-organization of society without um, the, the capitalist. So I, I've been doing this research on innovation and it kind of dovetails with this because what you look at when you see the U.S. over the last 40 years, that when you go back 40 years ago, a lot of the new products, the new ideas, the new processes were coming out of the labs of big Fortune 500 corporations. We were still heavily dependent upon the bourgeoisie. To, but now, um, that's changed dramatically, and those new ideas, those innovations, are coming out of collaborations between small firms, universities, government labs. It's the scientists and the technologists um, who are driving the, the process, and so, I would argue that a part of the of the crisis that um, you know the global financial crisis is that um, the that that capital um, 
essentially has moved in a more predatory direction. In other words, that the bourgeoisie is no longer playing this historically productive role, and so they're increasingly driven to extractive activity. And so that lies behind financialization. Um, and that, ex that extractive activity is also extremely heavily dependent upon the state. So the most important sectors of business, like big pharma, uh, the defense industries, the financial sector, are dependent upon these ties to the state to protect their intellectual property, to preserve their position. And what, but, so the idea is that it's not just innovation, but increasingly production itself that's moving out of the corporate sector, the sector dominated by big corporations. So, you know, one of the examples of that is open source software, where we see collaborations among the technologists themselves with no direction from, um, from capital. Um, but in all kinds of other areas, I mean, even the automobile was um, historically, you know, the big companies produced it all on site. That, um, but that now 70 to 80 percent of the value added in the automobile is produced by small and medium-sized enterprises. So the idea is essentially that the advance of technologies essentially gives a much greater possibility for organizing production outside of the control of big capital. And so I think that um, one can kind of see in the um, in both the strategy and the message of, of Occupy Wall Street, a kind of suggestion of what would needs to be a kind of two-pronged strategy for the left in this in this period. On the one hand, um, we need this kind of fierce attack on the corporate slash financial system um, to essentially weaken their death grip on the, the state that is um, necessary to preserve their, their power. And at the same time, we have to begin the project of building a prefigurative economy from the ground up. And I hope that Carl's going to talk about this theme, but that the, this development of productive forces makes possible uh, the development of employee co-ops, of, of self-organized work, and that um, I, I guess the, the way that I would put it is that in the industrial era, in the era of the great factory, the factory was the instrument that taught the workers about the possibility of socialism. You know, they were there producing and they could say, you know, look, there are 10,000 of us, we could do this without the capitalists. The, the decline of the left is very closely linked to the decline of those giant factories everywhere, except you know they remain in, in China. Um, but that in this new era, the way that um, we're going to bring the consciousness of the capacity for a new kind of society based upon autonomous production requires showing people that it is possible to organize production effectively outside the control of the of the giant corporations, create these models which we already have around the world, Mondragon, uh, particularly, but build on those models in the U.S. as a way to uh, prefigure the possibility, uh, as a way to instruct people about the real concrete possibility of a self-organized society. So I'll stop. There. Uh, this is going to be hard because uh, in the, the outline you gave me basically told the story of my life uh, and uh, I can start anywhere. Uh, you know, Marty Nicholas and I were roommates, Marty was translating the Grim Teresa. The first one of the first major study groups I started when all my miles groups would collapse was called the third wave study group. We started with Popper's book, and I went through about 200 others after that. Um, I think I'll start at the beginning. I was a young kid in Western Pennsylvania. I had a very blue-collar technical background. My dad repaired trucks for the gas company and uh, coal mines, and 
I was a young kid, I always had to tear things apart and put them back together again to see how they worked. Later in life, when I worked in a factory and they brought in computers, it was the same thing. I had to learn how these things worked because I knew they were going to change the world. So I became a hardware guy. I took computers apart, put them back together, really got into what the machine code and everything about what made them work and why they had revolutionary potential. In the university, I studied Marx. I loved Marx. I loved it because of the class of society, but I read it a little differently than most people do. Most people, when they hear class of society, they say, let, let, well, let's get rid of the capitalists. Great. But the way I was read it, I said, yeah, that's fine. But mainly, let's get rid of the working class. To me, a real class of society means to get rid of all of them, the whole range of classes, including the working class. And how do you get rid of the working class? Shrinking the working day towards zero. Shrinking variable capital towards zero, so that the amount of labor time and any given commodity approaches zero. So how do you do that? Fully cybernated, fully automated production, which withers away the market as well as the state. And other things. So I had this visionary conception of Marxism that I got from my reading Hegel and then William Marx. When I, said, I got into the university because I was a Sputnik kid. I designed a three-stage rocket <coughs> an industrial arts fair, and that got me into. University, but then I switched over to philosophy and science. Philosophy and science. Um, so I am, I've always been into this stuff. And uh, uh, I've always been at the question here about whether Marxism makes sense of all this. Absolutely. It's all in Marx. The thing is, so you have to emancipate your mind, free your imagination. Don't just look at the, some given text or commentary on Marx. You've got to get inside of his head. And you got to look at the world afresh the way he might and free your minds. Not just old dogma. One of the first things we did when we, uh, uh, all my Maoist groups collapsed, we started the third wave study. Is when, you know, people said, well, Marxism is scientific. I said, okay, if it's scientific, let's study science, cutting edge stuff today, not the 19th century stuff. So we, we spent months studying chaos theory, complexity, and all this other stuff, modern physics. That we wanted to get a really a good idea of what science was. We came to the conclusion that John Dewey's instrumental theory of knowledge was much better than the news of the dialectical materials in the 21st century, if you really wanted to look at it in that way. It was much closer to what scientists actually did when they did science than anything that was talked about in the 19th century. So our third grade study group learned a lot from Popper. We had a critique of Popper, maybe it's elitism, but Popper. I uh, had some very interesting ideas. And uh, there was another guy who had a very interesting idea. It was Paul Romer, political economist from uh, California. Draw a big circle on the wall and divide it into three. He put all political economy in three categories. Hardware, software, wetware. <coughs> Hardware, we all know what that is. Factories, means production, all that sort of stuff. Software, we know what that is. Programs, books, libraries. Wetware, what's wetware? That's software between your ears. Okay? And that problem I wrestled with in 1967. I was part of the group that put out the Port Authority Statement in 67, I'm part of the Praxis Project. The Port Authority Statement was meant to be the successor to the Port Huron Statement. It came up with the idea of the new working class. We were the American students of the Great Wars. And, uh, Basically, we said science and technology is going to vastly reshape the working class. The blue collar sector is going to shrink. The service sector is going to expand. There's going to be a new sector. We call it the underclass, which is going to grow because it's pushed out of production altogether. And there's another scientific university trained sector, technological sector, called the new working class. And it's going to grow. And our task is to find ways to unite all of them, and especially the insurgent sectors, which were then the underclass and the new working class, and find ways to connect them in our strategic thing. Then 1968 happened, the invasion of Czechoslovakia, the offensive, the two assassinations, the Black Revolt, and we set all that aside and went on a long detour. And finally, by 1990, I came back to it and decided to pick it up again because it was correct. If we had stuck to that orientation, it would have been a different story. But we didn't. And there are historical reasons why we had to be. 
you would have had to have been there. If you were there, you would understand why. You know, you walk outside the SES office and you have tanks all up and down Madison Avenue with their gun turns pointed in your window, and the city is in flames. You're not very much into debating force at the time. You're much more interested in the African American national question, or Mahat, or you know, the third world rising in revolt against you know, the countryside of the world rising in revolt against the metropole. Those things begin to make more sense to be empirically. But if you go deeper, I think we were on to something, and it was worth coming back to. So our third wave study group eventually produced a book. Uh, Jerry Harris and I wrote it called uh, uh, Psycho Radicalism and Left for a Global Age. Uh, Jerry later took it further and wrote Dialectics of Globalization, so the theory further. As far as the end of work questions, I'll end on those, because I, like I said, I could go on forever about this. The end of work stuff is all partly correct, but it's all because of a nationalist bias. What people were doing was that they were looking at the working class within the framework of a given nation. They were seeing how the blue collar sector was shrinking in the US, which was that which was true. But if you looked at it without those nationalist blinders, you would see on a global scale, the proletariat was growing in huge numbers. They were growing in interesting ways. Their factories were much more modern than the steel mills that were closed down for I was. But still, China went from 90% peasants to, 50, to just a, a month ago, went to 51% workers for the first time in its history. That alone is a humongous expansion of the world proletariat right there. So that's a huge growth in working class, just in China alone. And that second wave, so the thing about third waves is that they don't replace each other. They're all going on at the same time. There's still parts of the world that are living under the first wave. There's still parts of the world where the second wave is still expanding. And there are some countries where the third wave is emerging. And they, these are all simultaneous. They're not easy. They're like a hurricane. They're destructive as well as creative. And so these things are all combined in the, in the, in the way they operate. And uh, I think some of the people in the, who wrote the different, uh, you know, work, you know, work's going to disappear very relatively quickly. We're relatively, we're either looking at it too narrowly or didn't see some of the uh, interrelated contradictions. So I'll stop there. Oh, excuse me. One thing, uh, first thing I am among everything else is an organizer. I put out a uh, email, an e-newsletter once a week. It's got all the cool stuff that this I happen to like. If you want to get it, sign it. It's very easy to press one button and unsub it. Thank you. Um, good morning. How's everybody? Good. So I want to pick up on the threads that I think both Fred and Carl um, kind of laid out and say that, one, in full disclosure, I'm really presenting an analysis that is part of really a collective of Marxists who are also revolutionaries and view Marxism and science, and the organization that many of us are part of is the League of Revolutionaries for New America. And our organization and a predecessor organization have really been looking at this question of Marxism and science and the application of that analysis to the revolution in technology uh, and what that means for not only work, but most importantly for capitalism and most importantly for the situation of the working class and how do we really transform society to bring it into line with the technology of production that increasingly displaces labor from the production process whether it's in manufacturing or even in the service sector. So I just want to share that this has been a long, like, 35-year collective process. And I will try to, you know, present it in five minutes as you know, succinctly as I can. And, um, but, but also there are other, you know, comrades here who can also help field questions. So let me just start. There's um, a very new article that has just been put out in, in Raleigh Comrades, and I've got a few copies for those who want it. And it just says, um, as early as 1975, it was possible to see how the fundamentally changed economy was creating 
a huge qualitatively new army of permanently unemployed and that every technical advance made the position of the proletarians more untenable. And sort of where we have arrived, electronics, that is electronics as the basis of computers, automation, robotics, makes it impossible for this new class, it's a new class of dispossessed workers or permanently, uh, increasingly displaced workers, this new class to coexist with private property. Its program is communistic in the true sense of the word, each for all and all for each. So how do we go from that initial analysis to that really, for us, very powerful political conclusion, right? That this technological revolution is upended, is overturning the possibility of capitalism to continue as a system that has as its core nexus the exploitation of labor power for profit, distribution based on the wage labor system, right? Because so so how we you know do that analysis is is actually fairly simple. Um, the first you know, element is that, um, and I can get started with it, of uh, labor theory of value. So we still think the labor theory of value applies. And that if, if new value comes from labor, and labor is increasingly not part of the productive process, then there's less and less surplus value created. So there's less and less new value that can be both distributed as wage and realized as a profit. This, of course, drives speculative, you know, finance capital to speculation in fictive capital, which even Marx talked about as early as in capital. So, I mean, that just sort of connects this relationship between the, the transformation of the productive process and the necessity for capital to, to seek other avenues, right, for actually realizing real profit. So that is part of the crises, the increasing crises of capitalism and the speculative bubbles and the collapse, um, you know, starting in the 70s and 80s and then most recently in 2007, and the inability of economies to continue to operate. On the side of, it also means it's very difficult to circulate commodities, right? Because more and more workers are displaced and, and workers are two thirds of the consumers, right, in a global economy, then that's also part of the crisis of, of the collapse of the circulation process. On the side of the worker, okay, and that's where I'm going to go, because we see this process as creating a, a necessarily revolutionary process in society, in a class, a, a new class of displaced labor that has to overturn the existing class relations and, and the state in order to survive. So um, if we are increasingly unemployed and underemployed, and I think that that's really clear, right? That the whole discussion of the post-industrial society or the third wave or the new wave and so forth and so on, that I think that those things are, are real. I think what people who look at the technological displacement of labor believed is that there would be new jobs created, right, to replace the old jobs. And our assessment is that this is one of process, right? If you look at the process of industrialization, it occurred over a series of about 300 years, okay, manufacturing. I mean, from manufacturing to industry. And it spread around the world. So I don't think we can actually say that, you know, electronic production, which began in the mid 1900s, right, last century, mid of last century, that we really have seen the whole process of it. Because there's still a lot of people working, right? So we aren't saying that there's absolutely no labor that's employed. But if we are looking at the process, right, this process, this revolutionary process of how new technologies are increasingly introduced, not only to, you know, the industrial manufacturing sector, but to the service sector. Right? Um, intellectual labor is being displaced. Uh, uh, service sector labor, uh, healthcare labor, um, you know, retail sale labor. So, so labor across the entire economy, communications labor, right, is increasingly being displaced. 
So we see this as a process that capital must continue to do, even though it turns the contradiction between capital and labor over, you know, how do we distribute this new value, it turns it into an antagonism. It essentially breaks the nexus that once we are increasingly unemployed, right, we are, our tie to capital is broken, then we are no longer arguing or fighting with capital over the question of the social wage, right, or the question of hours and wages and benefits. But we are then left without a job, without the access to housing, food, shelter, health care, and education. So that this process increasingly turns our economic battles that we had into political battles, right? If you are un or underemployed, if you are a contingent worker that all of a sudden gets laid off at the university and you can't find another job, then what do you do? You end up in maybe Zuccotti Park, you might end up as part of the Occupy movement, but you are then part of this class of dispossessed. So our understanding of this kind of new class or new working class is that it actually comes from all strata of society. That the displacement of labor with electronic, automated, ro robotized, digitized production and distribution affects professional technical workers, intellectual workers, healthcare workers, as well as factory workers. And so we are seeing this pressure on all of us of displacement from, from wage labor in whatever sector of the economy it is. And it is creating this huge, huge crisis of one, circulation of capital because we don't have money, but it's also creating a crisis for us of survival. We also see the destruction of the safety net, right? The welfare state. As a clear reflection of capital's decision to say we no longer need labor. In, in an, you know, labor that falls out of production is not coming back. That we are really superfluous and redundant increasingly within the capitalist system of production. Um, and so that is creating a pressure um, on capital to say, how can the state benefit capital? And so the safety net is, is a wasteful use of dollars, right? Much better to give welfare to the banks and to Wall Street than to give welfare to the un underemployed. So um, I, I guess sort of time might this time up. Um, oh, yeah, but, okay. So, so I guess, in conclusion, the, the argument we are making is that this is a revolutionary process, that the displacement of labor from production is undermining the historic relations of capital and labor, of both exploitation of labor and development of surplus value, and it's also undermining the process of capital to continue to circulate commodities, right, without wages. In, you know, in the aggregate, and that it's then incumbent right upon that that class of humanity that that needs to work for a living, and they cannot or cannot get a wage that is a sustainable wage um, to really organize politically as a force to transform society. The final point is that technological production is the most productive form of production, right? Um, which means there's an abundance. And so that abundance of everything is really what makes it possible to realize a cooperative and egalitarian society. It is really shortage of scarcity that creates fighting and conflict and struggle. So that not only do you have the, the, the technological displacement, but the technological production creates more than more than what people actually, you know, need, more than enough. So that it's also the basis for a cooperative egalitarian society. And it just takes, you know, political organization um, and consciousness of that to create that, that reality. 
So I thought I'd give you each a few minutes uh, to respond to each other, especially in the, the spirit of provoking some uh, debate and discussion, uh, anything that you might have heard that you might take issue with or disagree with. And I guess to touch things off, I wanted to, to try to uh, specify two, two areas. Um, the first would, would again be Marx and Marxism and how this bears upon these technological transformations. Uh, for example, uh, George, in your critique of Negri and Rifkin, you emphasize the fact that Marx saw technological progress as bound up with the, the gains of the organized working class. That in a way, it, it is, you could say, the labor movement that necessitates uh, the, the implementation of labor saving technologies. So I, what I find interesting then is that, Fred, you described this the shift away in, in innovation from Fortune 500 companies to this kind of secret system, quasi-secret, quasi-informal, disorganized system of state subsidization, uh, even and especially under Reagan in the 1980s. Um, and at the same time, this is a period of sort of, uh, as we all, uh, as everyone sort of discusses, this is occurring, automation, cybernetics, robotics, during the time of a sort of uh, historic breaks in, in working class gains and in the rollback of the welfare state, um, which has interesting implications then for this idea that, that it is the, the, the gains of the working class that, that motivate, uh, that motivate the progress. And then finally, there are some issues over whether or not the labor theory of value still applies and what, what that would mean in the context of all of this, uh, including global proletarianization that has increased uh, over these decades. Um, so I guess that's one question that I, I, I think there might be some disagreement between some of you um, that, that seems sort of foundational. So I, I'd like you to just respond to each other to that, uh, anything you like. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a number of points. Um, first, I'd like to say that I just kind of want some logic of course, uh, in my uh, political development, I sort of began uh, close to where you were involved, maybe a few years later. I was involved in the uh, uh, journal called Zero World, uh, which uh, in the mid 70s. And it had a, uh, a theme that uh, comes directly out of uh, Marx's Grundrisse, uh, the Fighting of Machines, um, which was. Uh, you're not familiar with it, you have to check out the prize um, 20, 25 pages of, uh, the of his notebooks, basically, uh, um, which he mostly worked on in uh, um, Now, one, one thing that I've, I've noticed in my studies of Marx is that uh, those, uh, those met, met much quoted lines um, really are not developed by Marx in his little work. I mean, remember, Marx publishes uh, Capital Volume 1 uh, in uh, 1867, not a decade later. And in that decade, uh, Marx did hot work, okay, as we now know. Uh, and um, <coughs> in, that, in, that, uh, in that writing, especially when you look at uh, uh, Volume 1, and it's uh, sort of surprising if it was a, uh, if it had been a kind of major block, a major conception that Marx uh, wanted to hold on to. I think it would have entered in to the, uh, uh, some one of the body, especially the body of three. So I, I, I generally see in my work on the, in my studies of Marx, uh, I basically have uh, been arguing that uh, Marx is not about the, uh, the, uh, the explosion, so to speak, of the, uh, of the labor period uh, that he describes in the industry. And that, in, in fact, he develops uh, another theme in which uh, you can find, uh, again, in this, unfortunately, Marx's uh, writings uh, in volume two and three on the events and are very difficult at times to follow. But in that long section concerning the 
nature of the transformation of uh, values and prices, um, what we find is that another conception of Marx was uh, developing in terms of the future of capital. Not that the labor theory of value would, um, would go uh, into crisis and be basically abolished by um, the development of the application of science. <coughs> but actually, what would happen would be that as capital in response to many issues, including the struggle with the working class, uh, in its increasing, basically, uh, density of uh, capital in use in uh, the production process and the development of science and technology in the production process, the, basically, the rate of profit would be this tendency to the of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, so of basically the rate of profit. Uh, <coughs> and, and the only way, the only way to count, that he argued that uh, this was counteracted by uh, the capitalist system by uh, a number of factors. One factor, for example, that's very important is the development of low uh, technological industries, um, which would, in fact, uh, make it possible for there to be, uh, in, well, basically, an exploitation of labor in industries that, instead of being very highly organic, organically composed, there's a lot of constant capital in the, um, in the labor. The development of industries that were exactly the opposite, and that this would, in fact, begin to uh, counteract the effect of the uh, increasing um, employment of science and technology and basically uh, constant capital in one part of the capitalist, um, um, capitalist system. So uh, this, I think, was Marx's mature conception uh, of uh, the general tendency of where capital is going. And that uh, I, I basically I do not think that, uh, that uh, Marx's final view on the view is in general okay. um, I'd just like to uh, make a couple of other points here. Um, I think that uh, this view that I'm arguing for in terms of uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good one, and uh, I think that in fact it can be uh, the developments that we've seen since the 1980s in terms of the way in which this vast amount of labor has been absorbed by the capitalist system uh, in China, Eastern Europe, many parts of Africa, South America, after the neoliberal globalization, which has been a process that has, in effect, driven millions and millions of workers into the, you know, into the labor market. Uh, in fact, one could say the madness for capital to operate in these structural adjustment and closure processes if uh, it was unable to create a, a situation where much of this labor could be exploited. So, um, I, I think that that's important. And I, I think we have to distinguish between um, the function of unemployment. It's, uh, it's not uh, just, it's part of uh, the, the struggle that goes on around wages, right? If, um, it's, it's not just simply a sign of um, the fact that uh, capitalism is presumably leading a place where workers are dispensable. But in fact, it leads to a situation where workers' wages will be low. And of course, uh, and, and uh, I think when, uh, when I look at the situation of Europe at this very moment, let's say Greece, for example, I, I'm a Greek American and I have many family members in Greece, and I see what's going on with them. It's clear what's happening. The, the 
high level of unemployment has made it possible to drive down wages, drive down the living conditions. And uh, it, it seems very clear to me that this has been the function of unemployment. Uh, and uh, the final point I want to make is um, that let's be careful about the issue of employment, jobs versus work. Most of the work that goes on in capital society does not go on in the group of the job. Um, I, mean, I think that that's, uh, that's something that, that kind of, there's been a kind of theoretical um, revolution around the issue, this issue, in not only Marxism, but all of the all forms of thinking about work have been transformed in the last 20, 25 years. Because now I begin to understand that there's a tremendous amount that doesn't operate according to the, uh, the official contractual relations that we have associated with employee work. Um, and just one, just one final thing. Um, I, I think that, um, unfortunately, uh, and, and here's a, a bit of um, experience that I had with, uh, with zero work and with these, uh, these views uh, concerning the work and so on in the 1970s and 80s, is that uh, there is a desire, a political desire, to locate uh, the uh, vulnerabilities of capital within capital itself. Uh, increasingly, I begin to see that the major problem of revolution is not capital, but is within the working class itself. And especially within its divisions. And if we cannot deal with those divisions, um, the, uh, the, the possible weaknesses of capital um, are not going to be very um, So okay, these are some of the things. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I'll um, try to. Um, uh, sharpen some of these differences here. I, I agree with the last point that um, you made about the importance of the, the divisions, um, but I come at it from a different direction. And I guess I should start by um, admitting that I, you know, don't consider myself a Marxist. I mean, I came out of a Marxist intellectual trajectory, but you know, so the fact that Marx had these insights in the Grundrisse that didn't get incorporated into his later work uh, doesn't bother me. In other words, he was a very smart man, and we should take what was really valuable in his, in his thinking. And uh, so to me, that it, it seems pretty obvious that the labor theory of value is kind of reduced to nothing when you're talking about an auto, a highly automated factory, and there are three workers, and they push the switch, and the machines start running, and the that their uh, labor power is paid for in the first three nanoseconds, you know, and the rest of the time is surplus labor. I mean, it, it's a kind of reductio ad absurdum. But I want to kind of push a little bit beyond that, that I, I think that really the other part of the Marxist legacy that's no longer helpful here is the infrastructure of class analysis itself, that this transformations in the nature of production have change the, the way in which uh, social divisions work. And this, it seems to me, is the great contribution of Occupy Wall Street, is this idea of the 99% against the 1% is a very powerful metaphor for essentially saying the vast, vast majority of the population is being screwed by this very small segment of, of an oligarchy that are um, unjustly appropriating this, these vast amounts of resources through their uh, control over these financial institutions or these giant corporations. So I kind of keep thinking of uh, that if we, we want a metaphor for contemporary capitalism, I don't even like the word capitalism, I have to admit that. But, um, you know, we should think about Facebook. In, in other words, that the productive forces, the technological capacity, 
um, have developed to this point where a bunch of software engineer, you know, designers could establish this platform. I, I have to confess I'm an old guy and I don't do Facebook myself, but um, I know other people who do. But um, they, uh, they create this platform where people are engaged in this collective leisure activity of social connection, which can also be used, as we've seen, um, for political purposes, for building connections, for building social movements, for um, all kinds of, of different purposes. And um, yet, here is this kind of contradiction of the 1% and the 99% that the, that the hundreds of millions of users of, of Facebook uh, they're putting not their labor time, but their leisure time into producing the contents um, <coughs> for this this website. And here's you know Mr. Zuckerberg and the you know a handful of other people at the top of the organization. Um, there's an um, an IPO coming up, and the expectation is that uh, Facebook will be valued at something like a hundred billion dollars. And um, that um, overnight, you know, Zuckerberg, who's already a billionaire because he so sold shares earlier, you know, will be um, up there in, in Bill Gates land in terms of, of how much money it. So I, I think that um, what we, we need um, is, in a sense, to, um, to build on these, um, to, to move beyond uh, these old Marxist ideas um, understand that we've reached this technological stage where um, the, the production process, the advance of technology, the advance of society can go on without um, these, without the 1%. We can figure out ways to reorganize that are in the interests of the, of the best, uh, of that 99%. That, that's kind of the... Uh, I'll take a couple of things. One, I, I think you can take Facebook and Bill Gates and all of that and use Marx to explain it, and if I had a half an hour, I would get up there and blackboard and do it for you. But I don't. Believe me. <laughs> it's true, you know, you don't have to discard Marx to understand Bill Gates. And by the way, the problem with Bill Gates is not that he's made all that money. The problem is with the tax system that allows him to keep it. It's also the technology sector. Um, surplus value is a shrinking. Um, Ronald made this point. Uh, no. I'm slightly different. I don't, I don't know if you meant to say that, but I would disagree. Surplus value is growing in large amounts. What is declining is the rate of profit, not surplus value itself. There's tremendous amounts of surplus value being done in Detroit right now. It's expanding, but what is declining in Detroit is the rate of profit. It's the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Why does Mark use tendency? Because there are counter tendencies at the same time. There, are, at the same time that old industries are being destroyed or being uh, the, the a ratio of uh, uh, organic capital is growing. Uh, high automation, high degree of automation. There are whole new fields. Every one of you has, probably has a cell phone. Fifteen years ago, these didn't exist. As an industry, you know, we still had those old things where you had the dial or you can push them. You know, but most of it, a lot of you guys in here are what I call the net gen. You've never existed in a time when there wasn't an internet. Me, I'm back in the free TV, I'm a radio. So I understand the enormous amounts that just came off this. This is part of this is part of that. That's why Marx uses the word tendency. Because there are counter tendencies. And maybe it's because I'm a working class guy, but I think we've got a ways to go before we get abundance. One of the first things we need is what Bucky Fuller called the smart grid globally. You know what it takes to build a smart grid? It takes enormous amounts of labor. Old-fashioned kind, as well as the new-fashioned kind, to build the smart grid. It's a mechanic, you know, it's it's metal towers and underground cables and uh, enormous amounts of computers, and you want to link it across the entire globe. That takes enormous expansion of the working class just to build that damn thing. 
and it will take decades under ideal conditions of socialism to build it. <laughs> and without it, you are not going to have abundance in a true sense, on a global scale. Without just, that's just one thing. We won't even get into, you know, uh, solar power, wave power, uh, all the uh, uh, thermal, geothermal, all that stuff that we have to grow. The, the tremendous amounts of things that have to There has to be a vast expansion of the forces to get where we're going to be, and that includes some of the vast expansion. So, okay, that's number one. The question of the social wage is precisely the people who are pushed out of production that the social wage becomes crucial for. What they, are, what they lose is the actual wage that they gain in the factory, the wage labor for their labor. But the social wage becomes even more important because once you're thrown permanently out of production, it's the social wage that you survive on. We had this debate back in 1967, we had up against the wall, mother here from the house kitchen, we had the faction in SDS. And some of us put out the slogan, jobs are income now. Ben Ray and his, his anarchists attacked it. They said, we don't need jobs, income now. Because we're all going to be pushed out of production. So just to see what he was saying was we need the social wage, not the, you know, the wage labor wage, but the social wage, the support that people need when they are pushed out of production or they're doing work that, for which there's enough market. If you're teaching young people basketball in the park, you're creating value, but it's not in the market. But in a social wage, you could be compensated for that, or for raising children, or things like that. So that's where the social wage becomes relevant once you're pushed out. It doesn't become your wealth, and it becomes even more relevant once you're pushed out of production. Uh, my answer to Ben Murray is I told him he was a rapper this evening halfway. I said, income now, as long as you abolish money, you do it and go to the whole direction altogether. I said, your problem is you're still clinging to the, <laughs> to the money. Uh, you know, that's far in the far distant future. We don't even talk about that at this point. But that's what I meant about, you know, emancipate your minds when it comes to Marx. A lot of this stuff, Mar I mean, Marx is a brilliant guy. He wrote all kinds of stuff. He was writing to the day he died, and he had never finished it all. Capital is an unfinished work. So uh, it doesn't surprise me at all that certain things aren't themes, aren't developed, or anything. You know that? I mean, that's just because of the limitations that, you know, other Earth puts on us. We all return to it sooner than we like. <laughs> but uh, um, I think if you, yeah, I think if you want to understand capitalism, you have to study man. There's no way around. This is a sign up list for calls and loose Okay. Um, so, so I just wanted to to answer this this one last sort of point um, about the question of what happens to those of us that are pushed out of production. Um, around the social wage, I'm not saying, you know, I'm, what I'm saying is that, you know, capitalist relations exist within the capitalist state. And, and if we look at the reality of what has happened to whether we call it the safety net, whether we call it social democracy, or whether we call it the social wage, it has basically been eviscerated, right? Am I crazy or? Uh, you know, and so, so I think the point is, at a certain stage of development, there, we were a reserve army of labor, right? In other words, there was a point at which we would be unemployed for a period of time, and then as markets expanded, we would be pulled back into employment, and the social wage was won because one of the struggle of labor, but also because capital understood that somebody had to pay for the cost, right? And they said the state should pay for it, not, not capital directly. And that the destruction of the social wage is precisely because those of us that are increasingly un and underemployed are not going to be pulled back into production. That when the economy expands into quote unquote new markets, the production and the service sector are going to be doing that with a much more um, efficient, um, you know, technologically and electronically efficient mode of production and distribution. So that we are not a reserve army of labor, we are a per increasingly permanently un and uh, section of humanity. And that the real struggle is for us to reorganize society in a cooperative way. Um, 
There's one other thing about the 99%. We would argue that the 99% are not only very pissed off, right, about the bailout of the financial sector and Wall Street, but that they are also beginning to feel this crisis, primarily the most privileged section of the working class white guys, okay? And that they were in professional and technical jobs, you know, a lot of them have degrees, and increasingly, they are finding that they cannot get a job that is going to pay them enough to both pay back their, their student loans as well as to survive in the way in which they thought that they would. So, you know, so we would argue that the crisis of the uprisings around the world, including the 99%, is this reflection of the destruction of this system of you get an education and then you go to work and, um, and live happily ever after. So that it's really a reflection of this revolution that's taking place in the technological sector and what is happening to wage labor. Okay, well, I think now we can open up uh, for questions. So. Well, this is like a fascinating panel. So thanks so much. Um, I have four questions. I'm going to go through them super quickly. You can answer one or all of them if you want. Uh, the first question is about the question of organization. So um, I think that the idea coming out of um, autonomous theory of class composition and the way in which class composition has changed it, along with the sort of organic composition of capital increase in technology has led Hart and Negri to try to use this idea of multitude to describe the way in which we organize and understand the working class subject in an industrial oh, sorry, information age. And it's obviously been, like, I think, somewhat unsuccessful, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the idea of organization and how we organize the working class in an era of, like you were saying, simultaneous waves uh, and modes of production and also simultaneous class subjects. Um, and then the second thing I was wondering about was the idea of the question of the capture and innovation of innovation and technology. And so the ways in which, again, post-autonomous or later autonomous theorists have talked about <coughs> Um, technologies creating this sort of spontaneous or laboring in an industrial information era, creating the conditions for a spontaneous and elementary communism. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way capital and the state also sees, uh, seek to seize and capture those innovations and use them for generation of profit. I'm kind of thinking specifically about the way the National Research Council in Canada, which was previously an autonomous scientific and technological research agency funded by the government, um, has now been told that it should focus all of its science and technological research on business and how to innovate for, for the purposes of business and capital. The third thing I wanted to ask about <clears throat> was connected to this, the way technologies have their own politics and the ways in which these politics <clears throat> then can contribute to a normalization of relations that exist under capitalism. And uh, here I was sort of thinking specifically about something I'm really interested in research, this artificial nose that's being developed by DARPA to, to use to create chemical cartographies and sniff out and um, create ground truth maps of the chemical mm -hmm. composition of um, environments and neighborhoods. It's supposed to be used as a device for sniffing out terrorism, um, but also I think simultaneously creates a sort of ground truth of um, environmental destruction and, and normalizes environmental destruction in environments. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk a tiny bit about that. And then the fourth thing I just wanted to know was this question of technology versus workers. One thing I've noticed is that, um, yes, increasing technology allows us to produce in cheaper and cheaper ways, but because of this sort of tendency of the rate of profit to fall, sometimes actually using human labor becomes cheaper than technology. And I thought maybe we could just think about that a little bit. Um, well, those are very fruitful questions. Uh, so uh, I'll take one on organization. Uh, inspired one of my favorite things these days. Um, it's the only weapon we have when you really get down to it. It's was easy to have all the they have the, uh, they have the CIA, the FBI, the Army, the Navy, all that hardware, and whatnot, firepower. Um, I'll tell you a story about organization. Some of you may have heard this story before, so just bear with it. Many of you probably haven't. Uh, it's a story about uh, Zawadabong, the Red Prince of Laos. Uh, he was a communist. He was in the royal family, but he read that he had that battle fight against the French. The French captured him one time, put him in prison. 
finally, in the end, the Army had to have the French authorities. So go bring the run bomb and go put them on trial. They went out to the prison, and there was no one there. So on the bomb, first organized all the prisoners. Then he organized all the guards. Then he organized the warden. And they all walked away from the prison off the liberated section. That's the power of organization. That's what the working class has. How do we organize? Every which way. Every which way. We have to organize politically, we have to organize culturally, we have to organize economically, we have to build organizations to contend the power to build the economy on the clock. Every which way. The new one that I've been promoting for the last couple of years is the solidarity economy. It's a way of contending with the bourgeoisie in the economic sphere. Most of the left, very good about contending in the cultural sphere, rock and roll, you know, all sorts of things. Contending in the political sphere, we debate over different political formations, third parties, this kind of party, revolutionary party. I think we need But when you talk the economic sphere, people's eyes and ways up. When you start talking about the left, about building businesses, being cooperative in their own lives, they get a headache. Some of them do. Increasingly, large numbers of young people coming largely out of the anti-Semitic trend are becoming more interested in it, and some out of the NGOs. So that's a new form of organization. We need all of these forms of organization to build what I call the points of power within the war of position, because that's strategically where we are now. We are in the defensive mode, the strategic defensive of the war of position. That doesn't mean we don't have tactical wars of movement now and then. But the use of is saying we are in a war position right now and we have to build our strength. And the only way we build our strength is by building organizations. If you go into a battle better organized than, if you can come out of a battle better organized than you went into it, you have won. Even if your candidate was defeated, even if your strike was lost, if you come out of it better organized than when you went into it, you have won. Because that's the key thing that we need strategically. So if all of you guys consider yourself socialists and you're not a member of an actual socialist organization, you got the wrong idea. You can't be a socialist by yourself. It's no fun, number one, and it doesn't work. You have to build the socialist organization. I'm tired of people saying, we got to build a movement. Of course, we got to build movement. Movements are like waves, they come and go. The real question is, does organization move building trump movement building even as they are connected? And the answer is yes. Organization building trumps movement building even as they are connected. Write that down. Because that is very important. <coughs> I wonder if you could uh, also, uh, if I could ask you, Fred, to sort of uh, address the question on, in terms of the state's uh, development in. Canada around research. Uh, why this sort of relates to my earlier question? Why uh, why do you think these uh, these types of research and development shifts are taking place within various uh, within various states across across the world? Well, um, I, I mean, I think the simple the simple way of saying it is that um, that the technologies have become sufficiently complicated. Um, cutting across three, four, five, six different scientific engineering disciplines that um, even the largest firms can't um, afford to have laboratories that have six different types of research scientists. They have to create career lines for each of them. It, it just becomes too costly and the, the knowledge and techniques are too widely diffused. So the, the everything is kind of moving in this direction of open science. So like with the Human Genome Project, uh, they had people working on it, you know, around the country, um, and they posted their results, you know, what they had decoded at the end of each day. Uh, that accelerates the process. I mean, making the scientific enterprise more collective, more communal, accelerates it. So what we're seeing is this kind of networked forms of technological development uh, not occurring within one organization, but across organizations. And within that system, government 
um, has to play a central role, both as funding and as in terms of being an honest broker, making the networks work, because since it's a market-oriented system, all the private players want to appropriate the, the intellectual property as quickly as they can. And so the government role is trying to keep people um, playing fair with each other and keeping the process going, postponing the day in which they divide up the, the fruit. So, but the, the point is that um, it, it is one of these fundamental con con uh, contradictions that the, that the private appropriation of profit, of intellectual property, threatens, constantly threatens this collective bottom-up development of science and technology, and you know that we know the big corporations now have these um, mountains of patents which they use for defensive purposes. Because when they infringe on somebody else's patent, you know they they pull out this list and say, "Well, you can't sue us. We have 47, you know, of our patents that you've infringed on," and then they negotiate a deal. So I I think that. It's a, a sphere of contradiction, just as the, uh, the development of the sniffing technologies, the surveillance technologies, uh, the, the threats to our privacy, just, you know, again, from Facebook and, and the net. I mean, all of these are more of these contradictions uh, between this, uh, the way the productive forces are developing and the systems of private power, and um, that they're all organizing opportunities as Carl, you know, in, in Carl's terms. I mean, that, that the, the system itself can't manage these contradictions. People have to fight back and essentially exercise uh, their power to, to control the, the fruits of these technologies. Yeah. One thing that, uh, in terms of organization, one of the most important transformations that have taken place in the last 20, 30 years has been the issue of organizing on the job and not. And uh, the recognition that um, work, organizing around the job has become extremely difficult in the United States, years, I'm sure. And uh, that, that has led to uh, the recognition that you know, more and more of us, that uh, the site of organization is not necessarily going to on the job, and in fact, the Occupy movement is really an expression of uh, it, it. It now turns out that unions go to the Occupy movement to have assistance for their own negotiations. And we've seen this happen uh, a, a number of times, especially on the West Coast around the, uh, the Longshoremen's negotiations, but this is also true in the way of what, what happened with that. And the the, uh, the Occupy story is, of course, the Wisconsin story uh, of last winter uh, spring, uh, where in fact the civil servants unions, the uh, unions and so on, turned to basically a large part of the population that were not civil servants and that were not university teachers to defend their rights. And this, this, is, this is now, so in a way, what this landscape is showing is, is how, in fact, capital has control on the workplace, uh, at least certainly in the United States, that's for sure. And uh, and there's a uh, so I, I would just want to bring up that point. I think also I, I just want to respond to the issue of capture as a term that is a new term of the art and that is now uh, been used by a, a segment of I suppose a communist Marxist and perhaps others that we saw use that term. Uh, it's a it, it, it's a term that I I, I understand and um, and I can sympathize with. But on the other side, it gives us an image which I find really a little problematic. There's the image of uh, these um, technolo technologically sophisticated workers operating on a particular task and sort of autonomously developing uh, ideas of their cooperation, and then. Uh, sort of outside the sphere of capital, and then somehow it's at the door. Once the once the, um, the, the these concepts are fully developed, that capital steps in and captures the value of the 
to use in this situation. And um, it, it strikes me when I look at the actual production of things, like I've watched a, a film being uh, uh, done outside my window uh, in Brooklyn, uh, and I realized that the, the film apparently is an immaterial object, right? Uh, but the, the, when you actually see what it takes to put on a film, okay, it's a tremendous amount of machines, workers, and uh, actors of all sorts, and so on. You begin to realize that, um, that this, what's going on, is not so much a, uh, a free uh, development of, uh, of thoughts and uh, cooperative um, insights, but what we're actually is seeing is a, a task work. Okay, and uh, I think it's important. That, you know, often we don't see that task work is also a form of. It's, it's measured by time but it's measured by time in the sense of not only uh, um, the, the, the actual uh, physical time, in that sense, but, but, but social time. And uh, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's as discipline. The problem is that often these technologists uh, are, are very self-disciplined. They, they have incorporated into themselves so much of capital that, uh, in fact, they, they actually um, are, in, in, in fact, actually produce the type of um, work that is crucial within the time, within the time period that is, that is required by, by the employers. So yes, I appreciate your point that, uh, you know, the working class, however, has been pretty creative over the hundreds of years that it's been in existence. So the creativity that we see in uh, the making of these machines uh, is important. But I, I don't, I think the problem is that the overworking class is very creative. It's also, is still under tremendous discipline uh, at this point in, in history. And um, you know, maybe your sniffer things are, are not only being sniffing outside, but also sniffing the sniffer makers. Uh, so be careful of that. So. Um, just quickly, so let me just speak uh, also, I think, to this question of the composition of the working class and how they're organized. Um, I've been very involved in the world in the U.S. social forum process, and it's brought together many, many different working class actors who don't, you know, identify, you know, as they're not part of the union movement or whatever. So there's been a whole section of excluded work. Right? That is very casual contingent workers, domestic workers, day laborers, and so forth, who've actually begun organizing as excluded workers and as these international alliances of domestic and day laborers. Housing is a huge struggle the shack, from the shack dwellers of South Africa to the homeless um, in, in the states, right? So people are organizing around, they're part of the working class, but they're really or organizing around their basic needs. And these are actually large national and international movements. Uh, particularly indigenous have led huge struggles around water, uh, nature, and the destruction of nature. Again, part of the working class, but not you know, organizing against your employer, but around necessities of life and going really to the state, right? I mean, it's a struggle against the state for how they are going to get these, these necessities and under what conditions. So I think that is a huge part of what the new organization looks like. The whole question of technology and warfare and surveillance is just a whole other huge, huge sphere of discussion of technology changing production, communication, warfare, and literally right, new technologies, literally changing every dimension of social media. Okay, uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes left, so I want to ask everyone to ask just one question. Please keep your questions brief, and panelists, if you choose to respond. Uh, Maybe please collect so. like three, three or four. Um, oh, yeah, we, we can do two at a time. Uh, in the back. Um, most of the panel chose to look at these issues through a Marxist theoretical <laughs> lens. And most contemporary people are not embedded in that, including most contemporary intellectuals, apart from those that are heavily identified with the left. 
Yeah, and I think there is, and, and, and also the question of whether this is being driven as a historical inevitable. But I think there is hope for pushing these issues because of what is prominent among contemporary people, and that is, first, laboring unemployment continues at a very high rate. People also feeling a great deal of time pressure. The rise of these technologies has created new hobbies. Uh, people want to spend time with their Facebook and their email. <coughs> they don't need to fit this into their lives. People want to do homeschooling. Uh, new forms of leisure, there are people who want to go to Bohemian festivals, Burning Man, you know, this, this kind of thing. Um, technology has also made a lot of wealth very shareable. Uh, either, you know, things where you go to flea markets nowadays and DVDs are, you know, approaching a dollar a piece. Uh, you know, and, that, and that's under contemporary copyright, whereas it, it could all be accessible for free on a, on a, on a server somewhere, and you have, you know, all, all, as much leisure time that anyone would want to put into that. Uh, and yet somehow this this issue hasn't been, hasn't really become part of, of the, the contemporary debate. Uh, I tried to push as much as I could at Occupy Wall Street. I had a number of four-day work week posters and things like that there. And yet it doesn't seem to have really caught on. Like it's, I, I, I don't know what's holding it back. Um, Thank you. And, and, uh, I, I wonder whether we can just reflect a little bit on this Facebook example is to understand the relation between unemployment and unemployment technology. It seems to me Facebook was started with the intention of making money. The users of Facebook, through their leisure, then become monetized. And that's the source of the profits and the IPO and all the rest of it. That is to say, the work being done, are these people working class? In, in, in as much as they produce the source of profits for Facebook through advertising? Um, so the question of, you could imagine an entirely unemployed or underemployed population using technologies like the Facebook and thus being permanently underemployed unemployed, but nevertheless contributing to profits. And it seems to me, whatever one talks about in terms of horizontal modes of organization, collaboration, etc., focusing on the Facebook example might help me understand better the relation between technology, underemployment on the one hand, source of profits, and labor value of the other. So we have the prospects for politicizing a uh, shorter working week in the present and the Facebook question. Or would anyone like to respond? Facebook question. When I first saw Facebook, I said, this is interesting. These guys have come up with their online yellow pages where everybody can do advertisements for themselves. So I immediately uh, signed up and started advertising all my political projects. But Facebook is media, and media makes its money by there's three ways you can make money with media. You sell ads, you have a rich person, you're a rich person's hobby, or it's a charity. Those are the three ways they make money. Facebook makes money by selling ads, and you contribute to their selling ads either by responding to one of their ads or bringing new people to respond to one of their ads. It's different than a Microsoft credit, you know, and uh, it's but it'd take a long time to explain it. But as a side comment, <coughs> it allows Many, many social communication with visuals. That's, and it doesn't cost anything for people to do. You pay by giving them your information, not by giving them your money. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, that is the value you add. You give them information about you that they can then segment into markets and sell those markets, sell those ads to those markets, and so on. So that's how it makes it. That's the short answer. Uh, there's much longer one that's going well, I, I guess I would say that that it is a bit more than that. I mean, because it's not just Facebook. A lot of it's these games, the you know, um, the the online virtual games and so forth. I mean, it's a whole social world being created, and it is the appropriation not of surplus labor time but of surplus leisure time as you know a, a mode of of making profit. So it does seem to me that it points to the. Um, broader um, tensions that I've been trying to get at. But let, let me just say something about the, um, the four-day work week question. I mean, I, I guess the one concept which hasn't come up in this discussion uh, that I think is really critical for, for all of this is the, the idea of false necessity. I mean, it, you know, I agree with Carl that abundance, whatever that might be, is way off, you know, it's a few centuries away. 
but we live under a system of false necessity that the existing system is claiming, you know, we have to tighten our belts, we have to deal with budget cuts in the public sector and, um, and more hours of work and less pay and, and so forth. And the whole point of the technological argument is that these claims are false, that in fact the productive forces have advanced. We have the objective basis for a fairer, more just society, which can provide for, for everybody, not just here, but, but globally. And so the, the, real idea, the, the real point is that uh, we are bombarded on a daily basis by these claims of false necessity and the discipline of the social relations. And I agree that these technologists are you know, being disciplined by big business. I mean, that, um, the, the point is that we are subject to this discipline in, uh, in all spheres of our lives, uh, in the workplace, outside of the workplace, the, that we're controlled by these claims of false necessity. And the point is to uh, convey that these claims are false, that things don't have to be that way, that we can penetrate this and challenge this ideology. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, I just got, uh, okay, if I'm the first, you know, in the form of slogan, the major scarcity of the working class is the scarcity of power. Uh, because uh, let's take the work group. If the trends concerning the reduction of the work group roughly between 1890 and the 1940s continue, and basically not only would we have kind of a four day of the last one, but it would be about two and a half day of the So the question is, why did it stop? Which is, uh, what, what happened in terms of working class power for the ability to uh, reduce the work which Marx and John Free sees as the, the basis, the entrance to the realm of freedom. Um, that, that, and, and maybe it is the, the deep seated recognition of that defeat that roughly took place somewhere at the end of the first, the Second World War in the early 50s. And that defeat, um, and there have been various theories about the reasons for it. That defeat is now into very deep in bones. So perhaps a lot of people who look at the four day work week are now in so, so feeling so overwhelmed and oppressed that, that it becomes not a, a viable option. Not a viable sort of work, work. And, and yet it seems to sidestep the capitalist versus communist debate because you can still have capitalism under a four day work week. And a lot, I think a lot of mainstream people would like that, and they might not come to identify as being as left as we are, but they would want that. They, you know, whether, whether they yeah. want more time for this, or they want more time for their kids, or doing yoga, or whatever. You know, whatever. Yeah. You know, the, the you know, is that the is way not... to get a word in? Is to just start talking? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering. Oh, oh, I'll get to it. Right. <laughs> 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 we just leave some time for another round of questions. Yeah. Sure. Just, just one other. Okay. Yeah. I, maybe I'll just make one point. Uh, uh, just wanted to say that, uh, of course, the power of the slogan is not only because it's very catchy, but also it picks up the possibility. And uh, this is something that we have to face now, is that uh, there is a, a very deep recognition of the limitations of power that uh, working classes in our part of the world are facing. And I know from the Greek story that the Greeks have been fighting in the streets for the last two and a half years and have not been able to change. So it, it's a very deep story. I just want to make one small point about uh, what appears in, as, a, as a technological issue. But actually, it's, it's, it's the way in which capital is operated to bring together unwaged work from within a family, within a community. Uh, that, um, and there are very many different techniques to do it, to suck up unwaged work and transform it into Basically, uh, exchange that. How would that, that be done? We know in a family the tremendous amount of unwaged labor that goes into bringing up children, and how that's transformed into basically uh, the 
creation of the commodity, the labor power that is transformed into the surplus value. You use the old categories. So I, this is not a new phenomenon. It's just that, in a way, this is taking place using uh, uh, technological means. Uh, but it's it's done in many other ways as well. And it's very important to understand because it's very insidious. And it's, it's, I would actually like to respond to something he said and something that Carl said earlier, two things. One is this whole question, I mean, it's interesting about how the trade union movement developed and what it's doing now. Because the trade union movement developed as a working class organization, meaning that it didn't just represent its members, it represented the working class. And the big strategic compromise that the trade unions made in that period between the end of World War II and the 1950s is that it made the decision to represent its members and not be a working class organization. <coughs> and the bourgeois made that a very attractive compromise because they said if you represent your members and not the working class, we will reward you with constant expansion of wages and health care and all that. That was a strategic mistake that they're now paying for. You know, they've been paying for from the 70s on. And I, I just think that's a very important thing. They're going back to their roots. They're not starting something new by looking to Wall Street or looking to the community. They're trying to get back to their roots of being a working class organization. Um, on this question of surplus value and expansion or not expansion, I mean, you know, it's interesting I'm an I'm a ex-auto worker, and so I, I really look at it from that perspective. And the way I understand the labor theory of value is fundamentally that labor is the only commodity that creates an added value in the process of production. Not only human beings, through their labor, actually create new value. And when I look at what's happening in the technological world, it seems to me that I mean, you, I mean, my example is the auto industry. You know, in the plant that I worked in, in Detroit, we had 3,000 workers back in the 70s. And today, that same plant has less than 200 workers, and they produce more commodities than we did with 3,000 workers. Now, what that means to me is that each one of those commodities have less value in it because there are fewer and fewer workers producing them. So it's a small amount of value, but because the technological revolution has revolutionized production and productivity is so high, that limited amount of value, that reduction in value, when it's multiplied by billions of commodities, creates a sur uh, additional surplus value, but not value. And that's, that's to me, is the question that I thought Walden was getting at, really, mm -hmm. is that Value is decreasing, and the reason that's important, and I'll end here, the reason that's important is because this whole contradiction between labor and capital is a fundamental contradiction of the capitalist system. You know, and capital, I, I think the problem with the introduction of this high technology is not just that it's destroying the labor side of that contradiction, but it's also destroying the capital side of the contradiction, meaning that Capital depends on labor to work and to create that value that it needs for its profit. And then, and it, by buying back the commodities that it produces. You know, and, and so the more and more labor that gets expelled from this contradiction, the less and less people there are to buy back those commodities because they don't have the money to do it. And therefore, the whole side of capital is also being destroyed. And so I, 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 don't, I don't know if we're saying something different, Carl, but I just thought I'd... We're not saying something different. Okay. We're, just, we're just arguing over relative and absolute. Okay. okay. And I'll take one more question uh, before we respond on the panel. Uh, I just wanted to push... Um, I'm sorry I missed the beginning, so forgive me if this was said already. Uh, I just wanted to push one more time on sort of the politics, though, and especially the relationship of this panel and the what they see in relation to Occupy. Because it's been mentioned, you know, several times it's been mentioned that Occupy is this new hope, it's people organizing outside the workplace because, 
you know, whatever, the repression in the worst places of um, draconian, or it's, you know, um, a new form of democratic politics. But it seems to me that, like, it does seem to me that there are fundamental differences between, like, organizing around, to put it in very traditional terms, the contradiction between the forces and the relations of production. Organizing around, like, the potential for people to stop working, and organizing around, you know, the contradiction between the rich and the poor. Um, the 99% versus the 1%. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, the, in a way, like, Occupy is still very open, but it seems to me that, very classically, the contradiction between the rich and poor, like, can be ameliorated by several measures, like, including, like, you know, state intervention, including, you know, the attempt to move the Democratic Party, like, slightly to the left, maybe one of these days. Um, and so, <clears throat> it, it does seem to me that, like, the actual, like, to take really seriously kind of what you guys are talking about, these kind of deep tendencies in the capitalist economy, um, that one would have to really sort of argue for a certain kind of, like, perspective and program in, you know, an incipient radical movement like Occupy or whatever that was, like, the, the contradiction between the rich and the poor is actually, in a way, like, less important to organize around or subsidiary to the contradiction between the relations and forces of production. Um, that sort of issue. So I'm, I'm just curious what you see as sort of like what um, it seems to me there's a program to fight for rather than a sense that you know Occupy is just wonderful because it's so fresh and new, etc. Based on your insights, <coughs> I think Occupy Wall Street is I don't know, I have a very short answer. I think Occupy Wall Street is essentially an, uh, an initial expression of a popular front against finance capital. Finance capitalists are part of Wall Street. And Popular Front, it's multi-class. It has a whole variety of interests. It's not just one class. Its core is a bunch of stressed uh, work, uh, young workers, a very instructed young, generally young workers in particular. But it involves lots of other. That's why it's a Popular Front. And it's aimed at finance capital. It has a lot of demands, but the best demand that it raises against uh, finance capital is a financial transaction tax, because that actually appropriates, appropriates a, a chunk of surplus value and puts it back to certain needs. Uh, so uh, it's a, an interesting critical force. I think the most important thing for it to do is to seek mass allies beyond itself, the trade unions, the community organizations, and so on, and keep fighting. It's not crowded anywhere. So you don't have to create a hierarchy of targets. Just pick one and start fighting. <laughs> Keep fighting. You know, this it's not crowded up front. <laughs> yeah, just a, again, short point. Um, one of the most important experiences that the Occupy movement has learned has been the divisions within the movement. It's been part of all the major and minor sides of organization uh, uh, that has been, has been brought up again and again. It's the tension, racial tensions, uh, gender tensions, also tensions between those who have a regular job versus those who don't in this, uh, in this society. It's been the recognition of those divisions and how to deal with them that is the it seems to me if there's a revolutionary um, aspect of the African movement, it's there. It's that not that there has been any solution to these issues, but there has been a, 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 a very uh, um, a very deep confrontation with them, and especially with the issue of the, 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 the development of the relationship between so-called homeless and uh, the rest of the African movement. I'd just say um, very quickly that, you know, picking up on the case of Greece, you know, which is kind of the, the extreme example of the 1% gets the 99%, that if you oh, think of that, that it's simultaneously the, the wealthy versus everybody else, but it's also uh, the forces of production versus the relations of production. In other words, what, what would we be fighting for if we were in Greece, it seems to me, very obvious that one has to fight for the creation of that solidarity economy from the bottom up. That that the only option is to um, to build those jobs through cooperatives, through pooling together, through 
um, developing from the bottom up an alternative to a system which is, has completely failed. So that's why I think the two things are not really separate. They're really the same thing. Just very quickly, um, I agree with you know, Carl and a lot of what you said. It's, it's a populist or a multi-class multi, multi -class movement. I think that its significance is that really up a strata of the working class, you know, what's generally called the middle class, are really being affected right, by this economic crisis, but that the real core of who is really going to fight for the real fundamental change right at the level of, of the state are going to be those people most adversely affected. So it's going to be, you know, um, homeless and permanently unemployed people and so forth around their basic needs and the need for some way to reorganize society so that food, shelter, education, and health care can be distributed, right, to humanity because it actually exists. So I think that it becomes a political struggle rather than a struggle of capital against labor. At the point of production, it's more labor against the state, right? Because so much of it is, is not in struggle against against employers. Well, that's all the time we have for today.